Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to Forensics Talks and this is going to be episode 62. So we're still pumping along here and trying to get these done every week as much as we can. Uh, today I have Glenn Langenberg who's going to be speaking to us about some of the challenges of you know working with latent prints. And uh, don't forget we are on YouTube, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So your choice of weapon uh, in terms of social media and also don't forget podcasts too. So we are uh, taking some of these episodes and then we're putting them on to places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts and that sort of thing. As always, I always like to know where people are from. So please, if you are there in the chat window, uh, I actually already see some people there and uh, they're, they're uh, the regulars here. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, great to see some regulars coming back. Uh, let us know where you're from. I always like to know what your city or country or wherever. So if you're overseas, that's fantastic. Uh, I really like to see you there. Uh, don't forget, uh, because this is live, you can ask questions. So please, in the chat window, if you have any questions for Glenn, uh, our, our, our speaker, our guest today, uh, by all means, just uh, put them in there and um, I'll vet them and then be happy to pose them uh, to him. So uh, let's talk about Glenn Langenberg. And so Glenn is a certified latent print examiner, and he's been performing fingerprint examinations for over 20 years. He previously worked at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for 18 years, 13 of those years in the latent print section, and five as a supervisor of the drug chemistry section. Uh, he graduated in 1993 uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science from Michigan State University, and then uh, he got his uh, Master of Science in 1999 in Analytical Chemistry from the University of Minnesota, and then in 2012, uh, Glenn received his PhD in Forensic Science from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And um, his thesis, A Critical Analysis and Study of the ACE-V Process, uh, focuses on the decision-making and the application of ACE-V by fingerprint experts. He manages a consulting business, Elite Forensic Services, and there he provides training to fingerprint examiners around the world. And of course, he testifies at trials uh, quite frequently. He has experience with crime scenes and bloodstain pattern evidence, and Glenn has lectured and hosted workshops nationally and internationally at forensic science conferences on topics including Daubert issues, research, probabilistic approaches, error rates, and fingerprint methodologies. He's published numerous research articles in peer-reviewed journals, and he's also a co-host of a podcast called The Double Loop Podcast on uh, fingerprint and you know uh, forensic-related topics with his co-host, Eric Ray, who isn't here today, but I do have uh, Glenn here. So Glenn, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing, Eugene? I'm doing excellent. So we met probably, oh, I don't know if it was 10 years ago or something like that. Um, it's been a while. I can't remember anymore, but it was at the, it was in Chicago and it was some kind of a, uh, defense, uh, attorneys conference or whatever. Yes. Uh, a, a colleague and friend of mine, Brendan Max, who's a public defender in Chicago hosts an annual training on forensic topics for public defenders around the country. And many from Illinois attend, but quite a few public defenders from around the country will go to this usually like a two day event and, and they cover a wide range of forensic topics. Okay. So it's good training for, for defense attorneys. Do you remember what you presented on? Oh, latent prints. <laughs> <laughs> specifically, more specifically, but, uh, I Adam. do. And in fact, many of the things we'll probably talk about today are some of the challenges in fingerprints while also recognizing the strengths of the science, you know, where are the, where are the strengths, where are the limitations? Right. Right. Um, so I want to ask you, I mean, uh, so in the introduction I went through and obviously you have a degree in forensic science. So I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, little Glenn, as he's figuring out what he's trying to do. I mean, you went into forensic science. So was this your idea from the beginning? Yeah, I was one of the few lucky ones in high school who knew when I was 15 exactly what I wanted to do. I had a chemistry teacher in high school who um, knew I wanted to, I had mentioned that, you know, I had, he knew I was interested in science and good at science, but I, I think I had said something about being an FBI agent, and he showed me an article in some high school science magazine on forensic science 
And, you know, then, you know, told me, watch this show, Quincy and these other things. And they went, yep, that's it. That's exactly what I want to do. I really didn't want to be a police officer, but I like the idea of being an FBI agent, but the idea of being able to use science to, you know, help criminal justice issues and catch bad guys uh, that, that appealed to a 15 year old Glenn and Michigan, where I grew up, had at that time one of the most you know, renowned programs in forensic science in the country. So it was perfect perfect coincidence. Oh, awesome. And how did you get into the uh, the Minnesota Bureau of, of Criminal Apprehension? How did that work out? Yeah. I, I, once I realized uh, after I got my degree in forensic science from Michigan State, and I realized I didn't want to stay in Michigan anymore, and I ended up moving to Minnesota. And uh, once I had realized I was going to be in Minnesota for a while, there aren't many crime labs in Minnesota that will also hire civilians. So the state laboratory was one of the ones I wanted to move towards, plus a, a, an early mentor of mine, Bart Epstein, who's a very famous bloodstain pattern analyst. He was one of the lab directors at the time, or assistant lab director at the time. So it was just, again, perfect convergence of of coincidence. Right. And then your PhD in, in Lausanne. So was your, uh, it was your, your, your supervisor, uh, Christophe Champeau? Christophe Champeau. Yes. Okay. And again, it was another amazing thing. I, I had read his articles, but I happened to publish a study, a very early study on fingerprints and particularly variability between experts. And, and I had a throwaway line at the end of the article that said, if anyone in Europe is interested in doing these kinds of studies, I would like to do a study in a country where they have a particular point standard to see mm -hmm. if there are differences in interpretation or is this variability? Uh, is it because of the holistic approach in fingerprints or if you had a more rigid point count, would that variability diminish, which we now know today has nothing to do with the point count. But at the time, I just had this line saying, if anyone's interested in Europe, I'd love to do some partner research. Christoph happened to read the article and he was, <laughs> when he called me, he was literally leaving the UK to go back to Switzerland to start taking on PhD students and research. And at that very time, like I had just just ended my uh, relationship in my PhD program like two weeks before telling my professor, I don't think I want a PhD in toxicology. I'd rather something else. And so when he called me and I told him I was actually looking for a professor and he was looking for graduate students, neither of us knew this when, when he called me. It was just an amazing coincidence that, again, the convergence of, of everything was, was just it's perfect. I, I know I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> right on. Well, that's 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 what matters. Uh, if you enjoy it and you love it, then it'll show for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me about the uh, the Double Loop podcast. And for those listening, if you haven't if you haven't heard Double Loop podcast, something I listen I've been listening to. Uh, somebody introduced it to me about a year and a half ago. Actually, it was uh, Teresa Stotesbury who was one of your mm -hmm. guests. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, you know, I've been sort of catching up on that. And it's a it's a great. Uh, you, you cover a great many things. Obviously, a lot of stuff uh, focused on fingerprints, but other stuff too, like cases and 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 related things. So how did that how did that idea come about? Uh, well, again, another bizarre coincidence. Uh, Eric Ray and I were at a conference in Arizona. I was giving a talk there and Eric and I, I'd met him a couple of times before, but we had never really socialized too much. Uh, but we decided that we'd go out with a group of people and went out for pizza. And he was a big Game of Thrones fan at the time. And he had actually written a, a blog on it. I was just getting into Game of Thrones, had, had read the books. The show hadn't come out on HBO yet. So, you know, we were we were all very, you know, uh, talking about it very rapidly and talking about these things. And he said, you know, I've been wanting to do a, a podcast on Game of Thrones. And I think he had maybe even done a couple of episodes, just solo stuff. And we just kind of looked at each other. And, and it was one of those moments of, I, I don't know if we said it simultaneously, but we just basically said we should do a podcast on fingerprint topics. Mm -hmm. And then it just clicked. And, you know, he had the technical know-how. Uh, he had a lot of the equipment. He knew how to do a lot of the editing. I had, I had a background in radio of when I was at Michigan State. I was a DJ for one of the overnight shows. So we both kind of knew a little bit about the industry and how to do recording and mm -hmm. the technical part of it. And uh, we started recording a few episodes with people in Arizona, and we liked it, and it just started rolling into a thing. Well, 
someone pointed out the other day, I think we've been doing it now for nine years. I think yeah. Maybe this is their ninth or tenth year. And I didn't realize how early we got into the podcast thing. Yeah. I we were we were there early, and I I guess I hadn't realized how long we had been doing it uh, until it was just pointed out to me the other day. But it, it's something we've enjoyed doing. I think we're in our 270 episode or something like that. It's just uh, it's time consuming. It, editing and putting everything together is the time consuming part. And I wish we could do it more regularly. But our full time jobs, of course. Pull it in other <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's one of the reasons why I do this live because what what happens on you know here it stays on here, and then I don't have to do any editing later on because I started doing that, and it it is quite a time commitment for sure. And and it the is. research, the research you got to do beforehand, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. no, it, all, all all of that's very true, and I don't know that people realize just how much time that can take. Yeah. Well, the topic today is going to be on challenges to latent prints, and there's obviously a lot of different uh, aspects to this, uh, you know, ranging from bias and training and methods and all these things. So I, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out because I, I was telling you before, like the problem with you is that there's way too much material. So sure. um, can, uh, can I, I, I can help you. Let me let me help please. you with with one thing. Uh, having been in your position of having to interview people, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. I'll, I'll start with one thing. Sure. Uh, you know, you mentioned bias in a lot of these other challenges. And I, I guess some years ago, I had this thought in my head that, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and fix things in forensics, you know, uh, would bias, would the concern of bias be one of those? And, you know, I've had this relationship with ETL drawer for years and I, I've told ETL quite bluntly, of course, you know, we need to be aware of bias and address bias and these other things, but it's not, on my top three, I'm not even sure we crack my top five mm -hmm. things of problems in forensic science that need to be fixed. If I could wave a magic wand, I'd start pretty quickly with, um, in the United States and Canada, uh, that first of all, we have enough people to do the job. I mean, the workload is probably one of the most, uh, in, in every forensic discipline. I, I mean, I think we see that the workload has just overwhelmed the number of people we have doing this, which puts stress and pressure and other human factors beyond just bias on the workers. So I, I think I'd start with that and making sure that their pay is commensurate with the kind of education and training that they have. We see huge disparities in pay in different states and different regions and, you know, and, and uh, capabilities of money and resources to right. do the job where in some agencies in the United States, you've got one person doing fingerprints, no verifier, no equipment, mm -hmm. minimal and no training because the chief or sheriff said you're going to be that person doing that. And by the way, you're also going to do crime scene evidence collection, blood stain possibly footwear, right. take in evidence as well. It's, 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 it's so much on one person that how can they be expected to do a good job or know what they're supposed to know in the field? So I, so I think I make that number two and probably number three is a standardized training. Uh, this is a major issue in the United States. Canada has got, you know, a little better program where you, at least you have your, your police college or national police training programs. But what we even see in, in Canada is that, they, they go through that initial training, you know, 13 to 15 weeks. And then after that, there may not be a lot of training or updating. It's just kind of you go through this, but then where is the update? Where is the regular training? And we see so much turnover in Canada where most of the forensic specialists, except for the RCMP, will be doing the job for three to five years and then move on to another position out of that. Right. Yeah. Have you seen, uh, like, so for example, yesterday I was on a call with a number of uh, bloodstain pattern analysts and we were talking about different programs and such. And mm -hmm. actually there was somebody from the U S who had complimented the Canadian program because there's a mentorship program. There's, there's yes. a, a fairly extensive program. Um, are there two questions? Are there programs like that across the U S and what would you say is the minimum required training uh, you know, not just you go get a certificate somewhere, but what, what's the minimum in your mind that says, yeah, you know, this is this is something that where somebody gets on the stand and, you know, they don't, they don't have to be all that concerned. Mm -hmm. in, in fingerprints specifically, you're asking? Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. So uh, I know I have a personal take on this because of my own experiences. I was signed off with, under a year. Uh, I think it was right around 11 months. 
And although I made it sort of this ego challenge that I would be one of the, the fastest uh, through my training program, you know, running this race to try to get onto casework as quickly as possible, looking back now, it was just youth and ego. I, I probably could have used a few more months of training as well and taken more time. I have found through experience and even some of the literature and research that a year is kind of minimum where a year and a half is probably about right. We do know from some of the literature that you have to give your brain time to not only physiologically change and be, and, and, and your brain will go through physiological changes as you're becoming a fingerprint expert. We've seen this in the literature, but you also have to build up a, a fairly decent mental database of cases, uh, challenging cases when they are coming from the same person, as well as challenging cases when they are coming from different people. This is really critical uh, as part of any training you have to see how distorted latent prints can be when they're coming from the same individual and understand the range of variability that can exist when coming from the same person. But you also have to understand how similar they can be when coming from different people. And that just takes time. Yeah. And, and to get that brain calibrated when making these kinds of assessments, uh, that does require, in my view, a mentorship, someone standing over you and, and, and going through all of your decision making when you're selecting features, which you, features to use, which are reliable, which aren't, which are discriminating, which aren't, and giving you constant feedback. And, and I think that is best delivered through a mentorship kind of program over a year to a year and a half. Okay. I mean, you've been doing this for some time now, so I'm curious about when you first began, um, you know, there, there's always the extremes, right? You get people that are really great and then you're like people that eh, they sh maybe shouldn't be you know, doing this kind of work or whatever. But over the years, have you seen those extremes sort of um, minimize or do you think that it's still, mm. there's still some concern there about those disparities? I think, and, and again, my own observations, I think when you have a trainee who gets it real quickly, right, has this natural ability, what, what we talk about when we think of natural ability is that they have the ability to usually locate a fingerprint quickly, like find, you know, find the source searching, you know, through quickly and make a quick decision. But almost no amount of talent can ever really compensate for do they have the appropriate data to justify that decision? And they might have been able to make an instinctual decision or find it instinctually. But can they articulate that decision? Can they document that decision properly? Those things aren't necessarily a natural ability and have to be trained and calibrated to the person. So I, I think it's tempting in those in those programs to go, oh, well, that new trainee gets it. They're just so good at it. Yeah, they might be good at the instinctual searching and finding part, but the decision making part, the documentation part, the articulation part, that needs to be worked on. It's, it's just so tempting to, to focus on a natural skill and forget that there's this other really important component to that decision. Yeah, there's actually, a, I'm just bringing this up quickly, but there was a paper, it says assessing the frequency of general fingerprint patterns by fingerprint examiner, examiners and novices. So Irvin, I, I know those authors. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you do. But I, I, I thought this is interesting because what they say is that the experience, uh, it's not it's not that in a person with experience performs better, but they recognize certain things as as being more unique or you know versus the novice type of thing and they may have a difficult time articulating it but they do recognize certain things so i thought i thought there there are mm -hmm. there are some things that obviously an experienced person might have an advantage over uh you know a novice um so um what uh, what kinds of certification programs are there today available to you know let's say in, in north america is, is it iai is it like who who's the the golden standard Sure. Well, at least in the United States, I mean, the IAI would provide certification for latent print examiners and 10 print examiners. Now, it, there are a few. I, over the years, I, I, re, I recall at least a couple of Canadian examiners who have also participated and become certified through the IAI. But it is generally seems to be more of a United States thing that members from the United States take mm -hmm. it. Whereas in other countries like the UK, or Australia, you may have a national registry of experts or the national training and um, 
certification licensure of your experts. So there wouldn't be much need to take the IAI certification exam when you had your own national standard for that. But at least in the U.S. and Canada, that's that's what we would generally uh, go for certification. Right. Uh, let me ask you about some of the studies. Uh, over the years, there's been a lot of different studies that have come out and sort of hammered on, you know, different different disciplines and forensic sciences, whether it's bloodstain patterns or whatever, the 2009 report and things like that. Mm -hmm. But could you could you sort of walk me through perhaps maybe some of those and not necessarily the ones that sort of beat up on everybody, but the ones that are specific to fingerprints and what impact they've had and have they, you know, have they caused any change or uh, have they, ha has it been just uh, ammunition for defense lawyers? Has it been uh, a movement to fix the, the process? All right. Well, I'll take the second part because that's shorter. You know, there have been a number of reports that have come out over the years. The NAS report, PCAS report, the AAAS report, the human factors reports. Uh, have they become, uh, you know, tools for defense? They've attempted quite a few challenges using these. Uh, they've not been successful. Uh, generally, I tell defense attorneys, you should know these, and they can make some great quotes and good moments for cross-examination. But hanging your entire defense argument that fingerprints are unreliable on these reports is, has, has not been successful. It's not a successful strategy. Mm -hmm. I find defense is much more likely to be successful in their strategy when they can point out that fingerprints are reliable as a science. But in this case, the examiner, the agency has not demonstrated that they applied the methodology reliably because they have no documentation. They have no SOPs. They can't articulate these things well. So it's that's where the, the, the challenges have been successful in the courtroom, uh, looking at the as applied in this case approach. Right. All right. Yeah. As for the reports, I've read them all. And frankly, I I actually like them all. I mean, to, to various degrees. I may have criticisms of each one, but I mean, the NAS report has a great recommendation list of 13 recommendations that every one of those would in fact improve forensic science. And they've been said by other people, other forensic experts for decades before the NAS report came out. There's, there's not a single recommendation I think I would disagree with in that report. They, di they dig into a few things and go a little more specific and basically put DNA up on a pedestal when I don't think that was a, quite appropriate. DNA had its limitations and weaknesses, which in PCAST report comes out, notes that DNA has its limitations and weaknesses. In fact, that fingerprint field from 2009 to 2016 had done a lot of research. And in, in our field, we probably have the most number of error rate studies, performance studies, and bias studies than any other forensic discipline. And I think PCAS noted that and really uh, told other disciplines, look, you should be looking at fingerprints as a model for the kinds of tests and research that should be done in your field. So I, I look at PCAS as, uh, yes, it had some criticisms, but actually puts uh, fingerprints in a very good light. And yeah. then, you know, these other reports all have different different aspects that they bring to light and, and I think appropriate criticisms and improvements that could be made. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, just yesterday I was talking about, you know, these bloodstained people or, or that we were with or whatever, and there was a, a sort of a black, black box black study box. that was released. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, some people were, you know, critical of, of certain things, but I'm like, hey, this is good information. Uh, oh, you have yeah. to take it in context, but Obviously, um, the more people are doing these types of things, the more useful it is for everybody. Oh, it, so, it, it's a great study too. I, I think I had some some really some great findings showing how information, uh, correct information, can can actually improve their accuracy, whereas incorrect information, context that they rely on, can make them much much lower accuracy. I mean, I thought it was a I thought it was actually a pretty fascinating study. Okay, uh, question about the. Uh, well, you talked about the process being attacked, right? So I'm, I'm interested in the mm -hmm. different types of processes that are available to uh, different agencies. Like how is everybody kind of following the same thing? Because, uh, and also, I mean, for example, I don't know if this is a process, but the, your, your gyro, your GYRO, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ACEV, uh, you know, it's all these little techniques or things like that. Like, um, are they more or less the same? Do people have a lot of different uh, standards uh, across the globe? Yeah, well, uh, here's the thing, Eugene. When I when I look at let's say bench notes from an analyst, and it's clear that they did an, an analysis of the latent print, the way 
famous Canadian, David Ashbaugh, said we should be doing this. We should focus on the latent print and do an analysis and recognize distortion, select our reliable features, document our observations like scientists should. And I see that. And then I see that they've documented the correspondences, similarities, and differences between the latent print and the known print. And they've tr tried to in some way um, communicate how they might be evaluating these characteristics, putting more or less weight on which features are more or less discriminating or more or less useful. And then finally, how they reached their decision and what that decision was based on the, their observations. I look at that as here are observations, documentation of a scientific procedure. That to me has some scientific rigor. And the more uh, tools that they can use, objective tools or metrics that they can use, I think adds more scientific rigor to it. On the other hand, I look at agencies, and I'm not making this up. I mean, this is an actual slide I show in one of my presentations, where the documentation in the case consisted of solely a post-it note on the lift card, a single post-it note that said identification to the suspect's name. And I think they maybe had their initials, not even a date, but maybe their own initial. That was the documentation. Uh, these are very different <laughs> to me, uh, very different levels of scientific rigor. And I think my problem is historically, the examination has taken place inside the examiner's head and solely existed there. And if you want to know anything about the examination, you had to get the examiner on the stand and ask him questions or her questions. And that to me isn't science. It should not be hidden. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be uh, clear and accessible to anyone and challengeable and criti critical. So I think when I see t still today examiners conducting the entire examination in their head, I think it opens what they're doing to challenge because that does not demonstrate the reliability of our methodology. Okay. So what is the, uh, what is the gyro or, or sure. gyro, gyro, what, gyro. what is that? What, yeah. What, what is the, the sort of the, what is the concept behind there? Yep. So I noticed when I was doing my research, my thesis, I would I was talking and trying to communicate with examiners. I have asked them, well, how many minutia did you find in this latent print? And I might hear like a number like 12. And then another examiner would look at the same latent print and go six. I'd say six. And they go, well, I mean, I think I see some other things, but I just don't know, you know, if I if I think they're very clear or reliable. Six I'm sure of. So then I go back to the person that said 12 and go, well, are you sure about all 12? Well, I mean, eight of them I'm pretty sure about, and maybe four I'm less sure about. And I began to realize that, no, just because an examiner said they saw a minutia, that didn't mean they saw it confidently. And so I came up with a color coding system. Uh, actually, it, it came about when I was doing some training with a trainee who was struggling to communicate her observations. And, you know, she said, well, you know, I'm just going to, uh, talk in terms of, you know, uh, ba basically, be you know, best, m moderate, and, you know, worst. And and I, and I said, oh, well, you know, like green, yellow, red. She's like, yeah, like a stoplight. And it just kind of clicked. And then we just started using a color coding system. So green meant the examiner had confidence in the existence of the feature. And they were relatively sure that they would find that feature in a matching or same source exemplar. Yellow meant that they had moderate confidence. It could be a distortion or an artifact, moderate confidence. And then ultimately red was, well, there might be something there. There might not be. I'm just going to mark it just to show I saw something here. And we'll see if it's there in the known when you present me with a known. So it was basically a, a rating system. So green, yellow, red as a confidence. And then orange comes in during the comparison phase. So this is a way for the analyst to communicate. I only saw this feature after looking at the more clear exemplar print so that I can indicate transparently that I saw this later in the examination. It's a way to, it's a way to communicate effectively and understand the risks of working backwards from a more clear exemplar when dealing with things like bias, we know from some very famous cases like the Mayfield case, for example, that a, a big portion of that error was caused by working backwards mm -hmm. from the known exemplar. So orange is a way to indicate to a reviewer, hey, I saw this later, but I still think I should be able to use it. Right. Okay. So that's that's the color, G-Y-R-O. 
as as you were speaking about that, I started thinking about the way that the your results are reported. When I say your, I mean just different types of reporting. So, I mean, you've you've done a lot of work with probabilities and and likelihood ratios and things like that. But for the most part, I mean, do people even include those in the reports? Is that no. is that is that a subject for challenge in mm-hmm. in court? Well, so I mean, Christoph Shampo, you know, has really been you know the you know, the leader in this clubhouse for a very long time, you know, promoting that we should be moving towards likelihood ratios and statistics. So I certainly learned a lot from him. And over the years, seeing the reports that he has issued, I have begun to start using likelihood ratios myself. And it, it's still all quite new. Examiners don't usually have access to statistical models. And the courts can't mandate that fingerprint examiners use models. And in fact, just the opposite. I imagine the first time examiners start using them, there will likely be challenges that they're not generally accepted. So there'll probably be some pushback when models do start be, you know, being used by more examiners. But even today, I mean, examiners take their observations and they attempt to put them in a categorical conclusion box, you know, and identification and exclusion and inconclusive, or more recently we've changed and uh, uh, promoted a new way of reporting, which are uh, using some new language, but it's still categorical. You're still taking your observations and sticking them in these boxes, these conclusion boxes, as opposed to reporting a statistic or a likelihood ratio similar to DNA. Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, just in general, obviously not getting into the details, but um, somehow... Um, do you take into consideration, for example, uh, what I call like the closed universe, you know, if there's a party with a hundred people and only a hundred people could be there, uh, mm-hmm. that's one thing. But when you're dealing with, you know, the entire world, yep. um, how do you put together a, a likelihood ratio like mm-hmm. that? What's the general concept? Yeah, that's a very complex question because for those that are listening that understand, uh, the concept of, you know, a, a Bayes analysis, I mean, you're basically saying, do you consider the prior probability, you know, when ultimately reaching a posterior conclusion probability? And the answer is, well, you have to. Uh, but in casework, examiners are, aren't, aren't really thinking along those lines. They often don't have that kind of case information. Generally speaking, examiners assume it's an open environment and that there could be a large potential number of contributors or donors for a latent print. So I don't, I don't think examiners think that sophisticated about what we call prior probabilities. That's something that Christoph has been trying to train for a long time and mm-hmm. teach. And it's a very complicated process because it does require information about a case, which usually when you start your examination, you try to limit that amount of information, which is why people like Christoph and others have said, you know what, forget about the prior forget about the posterior, just focus on what's called the likelihood ratio, just evaluate the evidence and describe how strong effectively the weight of evidence is or how, you know, what's the magnitude of this, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but the magnitude of this match, if you can put it that way, mm-hmm. and try to describe that in terms, and then let the trier of fact decide in the context of this case, a closed population or an open population, what does that mean in the context of this case? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes it's, sense. It's, it's, it's actually a very complicated issue that um, I think um, deserves more attention and debate. But as a community, we're, uh, we still need, need that we need to understand what a likelihood ratio is as a community <laughs> and uh, how to generate them and even talk about them before we even get to that step. Yeah. And so um, let me ask you about some cases. And let me start this way. What what are some of the most uh, sort of notable cases in your mind when it comes to the, like, for example, in the bloodstain world, the David Cam case, a lot of people recognize that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, We we did a podcast, a couple of podcast episodes on that. Yeah. You you did two episodes on that. Yeah. I actually worked on that case, which is kind of interesting. Oh yeah. Um, But it, uh, it, it was one of these things where I was brought in for sort of a little thing and then it just kind of expanded from there. But, but let me ask you on the fingerprint side. Sure. What, what what are some of you know the one or two cases that are like yeah these were defining moments in Brandon in Mayfield I mean Mayfield. hands down it is our it's our cam case it, it's the case that really changed how we think about fingerprint examinations today the FBI did a, a really smart thing once they realized they made a mistake so I mean for any listeners that don't know the FBI 
uh, accused a man by the name of Brandon Mayfield, who was a lawyer in Portland, Oregon, uh, stating that they found his fingerprint on a bag of unde uh, un unexploded detonators in uh, Madrid, Spain in 2004 in the Madrid train bombing that killed like 198 people. And, you know, Brandon Mayfield maintained he had not left the country. There'd be no reason to find his fingerprint on that bag. But the FBI maintained it was 100 percent identification, 100 percent certainty. And then later, the Spanish police ended up identifying that latent print to an Algerian national living in Spain who was a known Al Qaeda terrorist operative, which, of course, back to your prior probability, makes a lot more sense than the person. Right. Even if. If I if, even before I start a comparison, you give me a guy living in Spain who's a known Al Qaeda terrorist or the Portland lawyer who I has not left the country. Who do I start with? Right. I mean, that already <laughs> suggests prior probability has mm -hmm. some play in our in our thinking of things. Anyway, uh, it, it, it was such an important, critical case. And the FBI very wisely did a great investigation um, and wrote a report saying, here are all the different things that caused this error. And here are the things that did not cause that error. The media got a lot of that wrong. But things like working backwards from the known impression, um, a, a culture that you know found that it was difficult to disagree with examiners, blind verification can be a useful tool. I mean, uh, APHIS systems can have an inherent risk of error that you don't normally find. In, uh, in, in other cases, there's a number of things that they, they were able to identify that help us improve as a field. Plus, they got a lot of funding to do all this other research, too. So it definitely changed the entire landscape of, of fingerprints. And uh, we all benefited, from, frankly, from, from this error as a community. Was that similar to the, there was the other one, I believe was, uh, a, a, the Scottish, the Scottish police officer. Shirley, yeah, the, was it Shirley McKee? Shirley McKee. Yep. That would be my number two. Oh, really? um, I don't think it's had as much impact. Well, certainly not in the United States. It's not had as much impact. It, it ha has had some impact in the UK as they've developed their forensic regulator program, but they're still getting that off, off the ground. But yes, the Shirley McKee case was another moment, but didn't affect us the same way in the U.S. because, frankly, the unlike the FBI, they never admitted that they made an error, right? I mean, in the FBI case, they admitted it and said, all right, we're going to move on. Although in the Shirley McKee case, they never found the true source of the print. I wonder what would have happened if the FBI had not if the Spanish police had not identified the true perpetrator or the true source of that you know, print in the Mayfield would. Would you have a similar situation? We'll never know, but they, so, they, they were they were handled differently. So in the Shirley McKee case, they, the police still haven't really admitted to any mistake or anything? Well, the examiners, uh, right. the agency has kind of sort of admitted, certainly by paying out Shirley McKee and settling with her. But I don't know that there was ever a real formal apology or, yes, we definitely made mistakes. And, and the examiners involved definitely did not ever own up to it. There was another case here in Canada, and actually you did an episode on this too. This was with Della Wilkinson, and Della says hello, by the way. Yeah. Um, hello, but, Della. But that one was the Bornick uh, trial. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, can, what can you tell me about your sure. conversation with Della and what happened there? That's, that's an interesting one too. It is. It's another one of these challenges to fingerprints, but the reality is this was a bizarre judge's decision who decided that he would... Um, do his own research. He had read articles that weren't really brought up during, you know, the hearing, and he's supposed to limit his judgment to what is provided, you know, during uh, during the hearing. And then he also did his own examination of the latent print and the known print, which is just nonsense. I mean, we have research in the field that shows that lay people are not as good as trained experts and and these sorts of decisions should not be left to them so the idea that the judge took it upon himself to examine a latent print and a known print and go you know what i think this examiner is wrong the examiner has made a mistake and it was actually a dead easy latent print that's what's so bizarre the this judge had zero understanding of distortion and i said it back earlier when we started understanding the natural variation in appearance that can occur when they are coming from the same source. He had zero of that. 
So any difference that he assesses between the latent print and the known print, he has no database of how much weight to put on any of these differences. And he does not know if a difference is significant or not. And that is a hallmark of expertise in any, any forensic discipline, knowing when the differences matter or they don't. Right. So on this one, I believe Della went back. She, she was on the second trial uh, mm -hmm. on the appeal, I guess. And uh, she made, she made a case like, look, uh, and, and actually, but there was somebody else on the defense side too. Uh, uh, was it Simon Cole? Cole. Yes, it was. Yeah. I mean, so what kind of arguments is the defense going to bring up in this case? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I don't recall exactly what his arguments were. I'm, I've known Simon Cole over the years and generally speaking, his, his arguments have become more sophisticated and more focused. Uh, his, uh, the, when he first started, it was basically fingerprints are untested and unreliable and we don't know anything about fingerprints. He has become much more sophisticated and has focused on the science does not support an analyst saying with any true level of confidence that these are from the same person, that these are from one in the same. Uh, I, I think there's some there's room for some debate. I, I take Simon's point that the only way to really state that is to have statistics like their ratios that could state that we'd expect these features to appear in X number of people in the population. I get that's the purest viewpoint. That said, um, when we treat examiners as a mysterious black box and we don't know exactly how they're reaching their internal statistics, but we test them for how often they are correct or incorrect when we have ground truth in these tests, examiners are pretty accurate. Although again, Simon's point would be yes, but those are synthesized studies and we don't know if that reflects their actual error rate in casework, which yeah, that, that's fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a fair criticism. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, in, in any research project, it's a research project or you know, a study. So, I mean, it's never the actual case. So uh, it's just a yardstick to, you know, to sort of re relate to or to measure to, which makes sense. Um, I, I was curious about the actual quality of prints. And I mean, it's one thing when the print comes in and it's like pristine and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's fairly in good condition, mm -hmm. but what kinds of situations have you seen where mm -hmm. you know, the quality of the print is start gets, starts to get on the edge and, and what people, like how far are people willing to go in these types of cases? Well, Eugene, I mean, obviously we haven't talked about this, so you wouldn't know this. I am I literally wrote a report last night where I had to check my tongue and just be scientific and neutral and just simply say, these are no value impressions. I disagree with the local examiner who has identified all three of them. I And I gave this to another examiner blindly, and she came back going, and when I told her that the local examiner had identified all three of them, I mean, the, the look of shock and horror on her face, <laughs> I, I was just astounded that in this case, you know, you've got these three identifications to, I could show this to 100 examiners, and I imagine all 100 will come back and go, there's no way I could, I would ever even consider comparing them in the first place, much less calling an identification, much less calling all three of them identifications. I mean, it's it's one of the more bizarre cases, extreme cases I've seen where I, I have no idea what this examiner is thinking in, in calling these. But this is where we get into examiner interpretation. There isn't necessarily a standard. I'm a big proponent of having standards. And so this is why I've run these impressions, these three impressions through software that measures the quality of the image and comes back with scores and an objective measurement saying, yeah, these are crap. And so when the examiner says, well, based on my training experience, I think they're good. I, my personal opinion is they're crap. And now I have a measurement, a, a model of quality that also supports that they're crap. But examiners aren't using these tools enough. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see more of these kinds of tools. I also ran them through a stats model that says, yeah, these numbers are crap. But when we get to the courtroom, it'll be her opinion versus my opinion. Right. And, and, and to me, I would much rather back up that opinion with tools and advancements in the field that have objective measurements that can support an examiner in their decision making. What kind of technologies today are 
you know, examiners using, which are aiding them in, I mean, there's, there's APHIS or whatever, but is there now new things like artificial yes. intelligence and all the other stuff that's going into there? What, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, uh, a very, very short list and you can pick ones you want to talk about. I mean, obviously image enhancement has been around for a while and Photoshop is you know, in my view, one of the best, a lot of us use Photoshop for basic image enhancement. Um, a lot of searching used to be done when you have to look for the latent print to find a match. But now we have these APHIS tools that can actually be minimized to a case so that instead of picking up the exemplar print and having to scan through and look for a match, you just enter them into a small little APHIS database of one or two people and search and just save a ton of time that way. I'm a big proponent of that called case APHIS approach. Um, this tool that measures the, the quality of the software was developed by the FBI. And uh, most examiners have access to it, but no one's using it, unfortunately. I think it's a great tool. We have statistical models being developed. Uh, Christoph Shampo from Switzerland has one that I've been using for a while now. It's, it's a very helpful tool. And then we're also seeing in the literature, not so much AI, but group think. What can we learn from other examiners looking at the same impression? And we're seeing that in the literature, and even my, my thesis pointed this out, that having other examiners look at the same impression might be helpful in reducing some of the noise and focusing on the reliable characteristics in a fingerprint. So if you have 10 examiners looking at the same latent, they're all going to have different minutia that they have identified throughout the impression but they will also have overlap and there'll be certain minutia that they all consistently see and use. Those are the minutia I think we should be moving forward with in our exams because that shows some reliability mm -hmm. and it takes care of some of the noisiness and the personal interpretation of features. I wanna ask you about blood. And mm -hmm. um, you did a study a little while ago, and there's others that have been working in this area. Teresa Stotesbury and I think uh, uh, I, um, Martin Iversdyke, they mm -hmm. did some work on you know recovering latent prints and things like that. But tell me about the work that you're doing here with, with uh, blood. Yeah, uh, great question. I'm glad you brought it up. This is just one of those areas that I wish more examiners realized. I would summarize it with, uh, over the years, <laughs> I have learned a lot about blood impressions that and I realized how little I knew or understood about blood impressions once I started doing this research. And ultimately, examiners likely make a common mistake. They've learned a lot about regular residue. That's the oils and the sweat that we have on our, on our fingers. We think of that as residue. The assumption is that the distortion that you've learned about residue is the same kind of distortion and mechanics that, that apply when dealing with blood. And and you will observe certain kinds of distortions in blood prints and assume that what caused that artifact is the same thing that would cause that artifact with regular residue. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. There are some really specific artifacts and circumstances with blood that only happen with blood or other fluids, basically. It happens with a fluid on your finger. And it, it, it really creates some pretty interesting observations that uh, examiners are routinely surprised about when they learn and go, oh, I thought it was pressure that was causing that. I'm like, no, pressure has zero effect on the appearance of, of blood prints, which is surprising to examiners because we learn that pressure is so important to the appearance in latent prints, but turns out it has zero impact on the appearance of bloody rich detail. Wow, that's pretty interesting. So, and so what's your next move after this one? Are you looking to do more here? Oh yeah. Um, I actually have a paper um, that I'm slowly drafting about how blood looks different on different kinds of surfaces and the importance of the surface that the blood is sitting on. It actually has a really big impact on its appearance. And uh, yeah, there, I'm working with a group in the UK that's doing some um, instrumental testing. They, they're developing a tool that can detect trace amounts of blood and at the same time um, image a fingerprint in blood, the trace blood, and also confirm that it's human blood as opposed to any other kind of animal blood. No, oh, that's, that's super interesting. Um, 
do you think that, um, or let me ask you this, what, what's some of the low hanging fruit in latent print research? Like what, what are some easy. of the areas? Easy, easy. You, you know, easy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What areas are, do people need to start looking we at? We do not yet have a definitive study on verification practices. We don't have literature that shows us what the best and most efficient bang for your buck verification scheme is. We have a lot of people talking about things or rec making recommendations, but we don't have data-driven research to inform policy decision. As we, I've, I've been screaming about this for 15 years. It's a ready-made PhD project. I, any P, if you picked this up as a PhD student, your, your PhD would write itself and then be cited for the next hundred years in, in fingerprints. <laughs> uh, we just We just don't know. We, we, there is no study that compares blind verification to open verification. There's no study that says that it's better to have one or two verifiers. Entire countries ha require two ver verifiers, but we don't know that two verifiers is any better than one verifier. In fact, some potential research suggests that maybe two ca causes its own problems uh, called displacement of responsibility. We just don't know. And we know that uh, you know, there are certain verification techniques that are more time consuming or resource consuming, but are they actually reducing the error rate or catching more errors or, or really being effective? No one has ever really done that comprehensive study to make a good data driven policy recommendation. Yeah. It's funny because whenever I think about all these areas, you know, I think, oh, you know, they've done it all. They know it all. It's all been done before or whatever. And then, you know, it, you'll come along and say something like that. I'm like, yeah, okay. That's, that's it's, very it's so, it's so obvious. And yeah. it's, um, hell, it's, it's one of the four steps in our, in our methodology. I mean, it's kind of, it's 25% of our methodology oh and goodness. yet, uh, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Now I want to talk to you about training because um, you do a considerable amount of training. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I should be mentioning Alice, uh, Alice, Alice Maceo, Alice White. Alice um, White, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you, uh, I think you guys have trained together before in the past, haven't you not? Yeah. Uh, Alice and I have uh, struck up a, <laughs> well, certainly uh, we were teaching uh, in, in different places around the world uh, here and there every three or four years we might team up. But during the pandemic, Alice Alice was Johnny on the spot. She saw right away there would be a need for online training and was the first forensic provider. I mean, within weeks of the pandemic and shutting down, she was there with a product. And um, I was really hesitant because I'm not a fan of online training. I, I, I like to look in the person's eyes, the student's eyes. I, I really need that, you know, as a trainer. Uh, but wisely okay. ended up listening to Alice and joining up with her. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's been good. I mean, we, we were able to reach a lot of people during the pandemic and Alice continues to provide a lot of training online, but that's the kind of vision that she certainly has. What are some of the um, more requested training uh, courses that you're being asked to do? I mean, is it ACEV? Is it uh, distortion stuff? Is it admissibility, uh, testifying at court stuff? Well, I mean, I don't know that people are necessarily coming to me and saying, we really want this. I mean, generally what we do is, well, certainly through the webinars, we have a, a set, we have a schedule. Every few months we run through the cycle of courses that we offer. And then it, it, what it turns out is some cycles, it, for some reason, I'll, I'll get a ton of students in the bias one and nobody in the statistics one. And then the next cycle will be a lot of people in the statistics one and then nobody in the bias one. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't really see a lot of trends. And then in teaching in person, I teach a lot of courses through Ron Smith and Associates. And they come to him and their company and say, we would like to host this class. I think they just kind of go down the roster and go, we haven't had this class. We would like this class. Uh, but I, I, it's a, I, I get asked to do a lot of ACB courses, some difficult testimony courses, and um, usually more advanced comparison techniques and advanced issues. Are you getting out to any conferences and, and what oh, kind yeah. of, okay. And I mean, are you being asked to talk about certain things at conferences? Well, uh, this is just another uh, one of those things that when, once I went completely private in 2018, I had to really be choosy and about how many conferences I could do a year. So I usually do the national conference and then one local conference a year. And my schedule just doesn't allow it. I'm just either teaching or involved in court or testimony or other things that, 
I, I used to in, really enjoy going to lots and lots of conferences, you know, five to six a year, but it's, it's really difficult when you have clients that need you for trial testimony or, you know, for other kinds of classes and you generally don't get paid to go to the conferences. You're, right. you're doing that as some advertising to help out. So it's, it's a lot harder for me to do as many as I used to. Okay. So, um, for you, what's the, you know, what's next, what's on the future, uh, for, for Glenn Langenberg is research or, you know, what, what's he working on next? Uh, me, <laughs> um, I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I left the, the state of Minnesota was to really focus on me and my business. I I'm, I'm loving it. I, I love not having a boss. I love not having to ask permission and I can just work on projects that I want to do. I'm getting a lot of great cases. I really enjoy the cases I'm getting. They're from all over the U S and occasionally some international ones. I have a couple of Canadian cases and, um, they're, they're, they're kind of fun and challenging. I mean, they're usually coming to me because there is some kind of dispute. So mm -hmm. I see a biased sample of cases, more difficult ones where there might be disagreements or potential errors or known errors. And they're kind of fun looking at some of the erroneous conclusions in the field or even um, cases where people have been convicted on potentially erroneous evidence. So th those are all fun to get involved in and, and really interesting. Plus, I get to work on research as well through various grant programs. And then lastly, just the the training. You know, when I worked for the state, I had to I only had X number of days I could take off for training and, and uh, teaching. But now, you know, now yeah. I, I, if I can fit it in my schedule and it works, uh, then I'll then I'll do it. And, and I just kind of like having, you know, setting my own daily schedule is, is kind of okay. nice. Um, if somebody wants to get hold of you, is it just the uh, website? Is that the best place to kind of get through, or what, what's the best place to get hold yep. of you? Uh, it's Glenn G L E N N two N's at eliteforensicservices.com. Glenn okay. at eliteforensicservices.com. Yeah, if you right, that's the website. The contact us. Yeah, there's my name, and there's there you the, got it. Yeah, yeah, right. Excellent. All right. Hey, Glenn, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge and uh, hopefully in the future, I'd like to, I'd love to have you back and maybe talk about a specific case or something like that. But yeah, great information, great work. And uh, please, uh, you know, please come back and all the best to you. Well, thank you, Eugene. Thanks for having me. It really was a pleasure. And uh, I, I checked out some of your past ones too. Uh, some really cool stuff as well. And yeah, I, I've been learning, you know, listening to these. I, I love the, uh, I love some of the guests you've had on and have learned learned as well well the the, the feeling is mutual so uh yeah hopefully we'll, we'll connect again soon all right sir and, all right and enjoy skiing or oh yeah that's <laughs> thank you thank you hey hang back for a sec i'll come back and, and just chat with you in a bit all right bye everybody all right. All right, folks, that does it for this particular episode. Uh, next week, uh, probably not going to be skipping next week, but we will be back probably the week after that. Just depends on how things go right now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, as you can imagine. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the chat window. There's been a little bit of good discussion there. And so hope you enjoyed this particular one. And like I said, we're going to be back very, very soon. So uh, take care, everyone, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.